Welcome back to the debate where we are continuing our discussion on the budget. The federal budget 2022 to 2023 has been presented today and the government, as always, uh, had announced that this was going to be something that is going to be for the relief of the people and the masses, whether or not that is the case and what aspects of the budget are important and are going to be positive for the economy and were essential for it to be taken forward. We're going to be discussing it. We've discussed that in our previous um, session as well in the past hour, taking a look at the very various aspects of the budget. The total outlay is over 9.5 trillion rupees against the growth rate of 5% without an increase in the current account deficit. We've also seen that there have been tweets by the Prime Minister. He has congratulated uh, his team and he has spoken about how this was a budget that was of course very, very difficult. Uh, but the team has uh, presented a balanced, progressive and pro-people budget, uh, making a budget in financially challenging times with so many constraints is no less than a Heraclean task. Zero tax has been announced for import of agricultural machinery and implants. This major step will enable our farmers and agriculture to progress. The Prime Minister continues on to say that the government has increased funding for Benazir Income Support Program. The Benazir Scholarship Program has been extended to 10 million students. He said that we have allocated billions of rupees for targeted subsidies. This amount is in addition to rupees 344 billion allocated for BISP, only deserving people to get the subsidy. He said the government has decided to tax non-productive assets of the rich, including 5% tax on the purchase of second property and increase in tax on luxury cars. The government has spoken that this is a people budget and that they have been able to provide the maximum amount of relief that they can. But there are, of course, questions that still remain in the larger context as well as we were discussing earlier, whether or not the political stability in the country is going to guarantee uh, the fact that we are, in fact, going to take the economy forward, um, whether or not this particular budget will be able to satisfy the demands of, of the IMF and and then of course how um, are the uh, the targets that are that have been given in this budget uh, how is it planned that this is going to be something that the government will be able to achieve or not mm -hmm. Whether or not the government has been able to fulfill their promise of uh, making this budget uh, business friendly um, and how is the impact on inflation is going to be taken into account by the budget as well. So there are many concerns that still remain and challenges that exist for the government, but we're going to try and analyze and understand the budget, the key aspects and the challenges that remain. So for this and more, I've been joined in the studios, of course, by Farouk Patafi, who's been, been with me in the previous hour as well. And we have now been joined in the studios by Dr. Gulfaraz Ahmed, who's a former Secretary of the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gulfaraz, for joining us and being a part of the debate and taking the time out to come in the studios as well. We've also been joined online by Mr. Shah Rukh Pani, who's an economist, and we will be talking to him in detail with regards to the budget. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shah Rukh, for being a part of the debate. Dr. Gulfaraz, I'll start with you and get an, uh, get an interesting outlook um, um, uh, in terms of the overall budget and how you perceive it. Uh, we've spoken about the various aspects of the budget and we'll dissect them as the discussion continues. Um, but as, a, as an overall picture of the budget, um, how do you see it and uh, when it was unveiled, uh, were you actually happy? Well, first of all, I must say that the budget has come out in very difficult circumstances. Um, this government too hasn't been there uh, long enough and uh, soon after they uh, came into being they were uh, saddled with the responsibility of preparing the budget uh, in a short time frame. Um, so given the current realities, first of all I want to say this thing that uh, there are certain peculiarities of the time which normally do not uh, exist in normal times, first of all, there is a worldwide uh, food shortage, food crisis, food inflation, and mm. food prices. Mm. And that has brought about a unprecedented sort of um, increase in cost of living and food inflation. Now, that thing um, requires immediate steps because longer you take, uh, to import the shortfall in food like cooking oil, like wheat, or maybe some sugar, um, greater would be the effort required later and also the suffering of the people. Um, second thing is that the, as you can see, there is unprecedented heat wave obtaining in the region, particularly Pakistan and maybe some parts of India. And this heat wave has uh, created uh, difficulty for all kinds of things, agriculture for example, the crops are getting damaged, the fruit 
orchard trees are getting damaged and people are finding it difficult to um, have a reasonably uh, comfortable life. And government has to be able to uh, reach out to the people during this time and help them meet the uh, consequences of heat wave a little bit more um, comfortably. Hmm. And that too requires um, uh, lots of uh, considerations and somebody's subsidy um, on energy as well. And then we also have a very difficult um, uh, political and a geostrategic situation in the world where the, 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 the war in Ukraine is gaining more and more momentum and affecting more and more countries and more and more uh, segments of the economy. So uh, taking all those things into account, um, this uh, budget came about in very difficult circumstances. Now, it's very difficult for me to uh, pass a judgment on the budget. They perhaps uh, uh, have done what they could in a short time. They had a, uh, an experienced um, finance minister and therefore one did expect that some of the current realities that required some uh, government attention, they would be uh, addressed. Uh, some of the things that you just mentioned, for example, they have the Pakistan Pakistan government during the last three, four years, since the start of COVID, they had a very wise policy instead of making large scale uh, investment on people, mm. uh, they targeted the investment people and therefore they did not lose so much of cash uh, in general um, subsidy to the people and that's what uh, saved our economy and right. we were able to maintain a very healthy um, nearly 6% growth over the last two hmm. years and our um, uh, the balance of payment, our, uh, for example, our um, foreign exchange um, stood at nearly six, million, six billion dollars plus at the um, last few months, which was uh, considerably more than um, the, the one billion dollar negative which this last government uh, uh, took over. So, so from mm. that point of view, there are certain areas in which this government has got support. Second mm. thing is that after a very long time, uh, when our exports had remained frozen, or sometime they were uh, receding, that the export have started picking up, which is something, the momentum that this government should carry on, not only maintain that momentum, but they must build upon that Correct. momentum, and they bring in must, uh, their own uh, priorities and uh, promote the export. Right, absolutely. The, I'll the, also go to the, the last right, point yes. I may just mention is that uh, when we talk about export, there's one area where Pakistan has potential, and that is in the IT industry hmm. because of the untapped brains, because of the uh, burgeoning uh, uh, IT industry in places like Lahore. We need to have a greater share of IT exports in our total export earning and some inroads have been made in that direction and I hope that the government is able to build upon that, bring in their own momentum initiative and increase the IT exports as quickly uh, as they possibly can. Absolutely. Um, Mr. <coughs> Sharukh, I'd like to take in your take as well uh, with regards to this budget. <coughs> we know that, that the, the Prime Minister um, and the leadership has been talking about how uh, they will be able to uh, provide a budget that uh, that is uh, the maximum possible uh, relief for the people. And the PM has also tweeted that this budget is, in fact, progressive and pro-people. Would you agree? Well, it's very hard. So the thing about budgets in Pakistan and, and more so in, from other countries, they're promissory notes. So they're basically commitments which seldom completely are followed through. So governments every within a few months of going into a fiscal year tend to uh, circumvent or deviate from the budgets they have already set themselves just a few months in advance. So we should take all of this with a lot of grains of salt to what's being promised. Now, having said that, uh, it's not a, it, it sort of tries to achieve this middle ground between being a stabilization budget, which is necessary to appease the IMF because the key challenge for the government is external financing. So it has to give sort of, it has to bring the budget deficit in control. So that because of that, it has to sort of 
impose more taxes. So that's one one area. And the other is that it still tries to generate some growth, provide some tax relief for certain people, uh, 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 such as people who make less than 100, 1 lakh rupees a month. So it tries to achieve some sort of a middle ground in both. But what's going to really matter now is how uh, how the government is able to fix its external financing problems over the coming months. And secondly, how the government is able to generate uh, or fix the sort of the underlying structural issues in the country's economy, because the budget doesn't actually do reforms. It sort of sets a very basic parameter of how where the government wants to spend money. But the government, the, the key challenge is beyond that. It's it, it's it's fine. The government is saying that okay, we will spend X amount of money on this, which is great. But right now, what people of Pakistan are going to be uh, about to experience is a significant rise in inflation. They say that they're going to bring it down to 11 odd percent. It's going to be probably be around 20 percent, and the cost of living increase is going to be really, really significant. So, what the government owes to the people is deep structural reforms to the economy, so people of Pakistan don't have to withstand every three years painful stabilization reforms. The rich are fine. The ordinary people are the ones who end up holding the uh, holding much of the weight here. So that's where the government should focus on now. Right. Regarding the outlay and uh, this discrepancy uh, between the expenditure and the inflows, uh, do you think that this amount that that is missing from the kitty, it is going to be humongous and there's going to be many challenges to get that amount? I'm talking about fiscal deficit. Well, it really depends on how the government looks at tax administration over the coming few months. So there are some things which are promising. So I particularly like the idea of taxing properties more, although, but now it's going to question it. The devil is in detail. How do you actually do it? How do you enforce compliance? Mm -hmm. Where will you do it? Do you have authority to do it in provinces or not? There's a super tax on sort of increasing taxes on banks, uh, which makes sense. Uh, there's taxes on high net worth individuals. But again, the problem is how do you enforce all of this? Uh, there's something which I just read. I'm not completely certain. There's uh, uh, there's some budgeted amount for, from petroleum levy, which I think is unrealistic given the cost of petroleum. They can't tax it. It's already very expensive. So it's not going to be a walk in the park. It's, there's a lot of work. So it's very easy saying that we will raise X amount of money um, and we can give you certain amounts of bricks. But once you actually have to do it, that's going to be hard. And a, a significant complication here is going to be the import bill because much of FBI taxes are import taxes. So if the government is trying to decrease imports to bring the trade deficit in, into sort of account, uh, and manage that front, it is also going to end up decreasing uh, tax revenue. So how it's going to square those two things which are on the opposite direction, pulling the government in opposite directions apart. So it's a very difficult situation the government is in. So it's, it's again, the devil is in detail. So it's going to, we're going to figure it out over the coming months how much, uh, how much of these targets are achievable. And when we talk about uh, uh, not just perhaps the inflation target as well, there are so many other targets that we've earlier discussed that um, are, of course, over ambitious. And this is what um, the government has put forward. And, and, and it is something that, that, that needs to be taken seriously as well. Um, and when we talk about these targets, uh, Mr. Gulfaraz, um, then, then there, of course, there's, of course, the, the aspect of implementation um, and the fact that whether or not the government has a certain sort of strategy uh, to account for it as well. Do you think that the government um, uh, will be able to <clears throat> achieve the targets that have been set, or do you think that they are over ambitious and uh, will perhaps require deep structural reforms, as uh, Mr. Shahrukh was talking about? And uh, Dr. Gulfraz, can I also request you, although we are, uh, it, uh, the temptation uh, is enough uh, for, to look in the, uh, into the screen, you'll have to look into the camera okay. when you speak so that okay. we have an eye contact with the viewer as well. Please go ahead. Um, well, as far as the implementation is concerned, that's always a challenge, particularly in our setting. First of all, we may not be able to visualize uh, effective programs and uh, include them in the budget and include the right priorities which can help us achieve the results of the program. But in these particular circumstances, when there is, uh, I don't want to bring in the element of political instability when there is a political instability in the country it's, it's important. that it is, is going factor. to impact mm. the implementation program. First of all, um, this government would remain extremely conscious of the fact that they should try to um, not um, alienate people. Uh, 
Hmm. Uh, they are expecting to go to votes very soon, um, you know, when, but uh, still not too far away. So from that point of view, they would want to um, keep the people happy. And when you are trying to keep the people happy, then a lot of the uh, hard programs that you need to concentrate on in order to achieve some of those budgetary targets, tar hmm. is you start slipping on that. Hmm. So I think um, um, at best, uh, there would be um, a, a mid-level uh, effort placed on the implementation. More effort would be on perhaps not displeasing the people in the short term. Right. Um, there's, of course, there's also the aspect that you were earlier highlighting uh, with regards to the heat wave as well. And that's, of course, mm. an important concern, mm. not only for Pakistan, but many other countries as well. And we know that 10 billion rupees have been allocated to counter climate change effects. And um, this is, of course, an important sector. And earlier, uh, we were talking about with the previous guest of how this particular amount may not be able to cater to the needs that we have with regards to uh, uh, mitigating the effects of mm, climate yes, change. Um, Mr. Shadow, mm. do you think that perhaps... Uh, the kind of allocations, including the ones uh, with reference to climate change uh, that have been made in various sectors, also the IT sector that earlier uh, Dr. Gultras pointed out as being an important one for not just the uh, growth of the economy, but also to encourage uh, you to come forward, um, will, will be enough that the, the kind of spending that we have, of course, you've highlighted how this is, of course, uh, a target or, or, or something, a claim that has been set by the government and the implementation aspect exists. But regardless, uh, the, the kind of uh, numbers that we see right now, now and where we see them, do you think that this is this, this seems to be um, the right amount of spending in the right places by the government? So I think we need to realize that the, when the federal government, the, sorry, I'm getting an echo back. I don't know. So let me fix that. Uh, we can find now. Um, so because of the well, first of all, Pakistan of course needs more money to spend on all of these critical public investments. The, the government do actually doesn't have a lot of money. It's around 8 9% of the GDP it collects in revenue. So it has to move that ahead to about 14 15 16% to make all these important public investments. Now, given what happens is basically when the federal government gets this money from FBR, it's such a tiny amount, and then about 40 to 45% this year, the coming fiscal year, is going to go into debt, servicing the debt. Then you take out all the recurring expenses, so the salaries of people, pensions are really, really, really big part of our government outlay. Uh, you take out defense, you take out the fiscal transfers to provinces. There isn't really much money left for the federal government. The federal government starts making investments in debt again, which would be so th th there, there are structural constraints to public finance in Pakistan, and they have to sort of think about this is how do you increase the envelope of tax revenue quite substantially in order to make these important investments. Otherwise, no, they say the, the aim is like 800 billion rupees uh, uh, to invest in public sector development. And that's basically the money which is the most critical investment. That's where basically investing in new things the government does. And it's highly unlikely they will meet that because you have to pay people's salaries, you have to pay pensions. But the thing which you can actually most easily cut off is the new investments. And that probably will be cut off too. Uh, on the climate change specifically, it's it's it's. Uh, I don't know what exactly that head is. Is it for the? I, I presume it's for the Ministry of Climate Change, and much of it will probably go into paying for salaries for people there, or will go for recurring expenses. So, how the federal government is able to make significant investments in climate mitigation or adaptation is it's, it's, it, certainly it won't be ten billion. Uh, we'll, we'll, ten billion will cover it. So things like. Investment. So one thing which I would have really hoped would be a very substantial investment in public transport across the country. I know it's a, it's a provincial domain, but federal government could have taken the lead here and said, considering the price of fuel, considering climate change impact, we are going to make substantial and significant investment in public transport in the 2030 biggest cities of Pakistan to reduce pollution, reduce emissions, but also to provide a cushion to people who can't afford to spend 200 odd rupees to, for a liter of petrol. Right. And that is an important question, although uh, <clears throat> given that Pakistan is a federal system, there is some responsibility of provincial governments as well. But uh, Sharukh Bani, uh, let me ask you about the pay and pension issue that you raised as well. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was sitting in one of the provinces with the chief minister, the then chief minister, and a budget was to be presented. The biggest concern that he raised, and he, he seemed worried about it, 
is that the pension, total amount of pension is soon going to overtake uh, the amount of pays that uh, the government actually uh, spends money on. Why is it that this, this issue has been lingering for quite <coughs> some time? Why haven't we found a solution to it? You talk about structural constraints, it is one huge issue, right? Yeah, it is. And it, so, there, so uh, to credit to the government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa over the past few years, uh, and Mr. Chagra, I believe, the finance minister, who has taken some structural reforms to the pension fund there, and Punjab has been considering some stuff, but was much lower to implement that. But it's, it's basically because the size of the public service, the civil service, and these are people not in sort of the PAS, so not grade 18 and above, but people below, which is over 90% of the government employees, and uh, the way the st structure is, uh, uh, inside, uh, the pension structure is uh, set up, you can basically be paying people for multiple lifetimes. So if someone dies, their wife gets it, the wife dies, the child gets it, the child, if it's not married, is married, has a widow, she gets So there's a whole bunch of things, uh, and it, it can last for several hundred years. Because the, pen, the critical problem is because the pension fund is not indexed. So it's not like you're paying what happens normally, right? So I live, I work for the University of Oxford and I have a pension fund. And every year I give 15% of my uh, salary and then the employers match it. And it goes into an index fund. So it's invested in the stock market. So it uh, generates a return, which is beyond, which is uh, higher than inflation. Mm -hmm. And so that pension is then paid out when I retire, which is what should be, unless otherwise what Pakistan does is that every year in the budget, it pays out the pension which means that because people keep on increasing and you keep we have political pressure to increase pensions because cost of living is going up so you end up with a with a point where 20 30 40% of your budget is just going into paying for people's pensions and this is a problem in Pakistan railways and also state owned enterprises so this is a major structural issue and that requires both set, so there is uh, dr mifta did set up a fund in his budget speech it, this is a budget speech so he did say a 10 billion rupee fund i believe it's not it's, it's very little, but it's something. Um, uh, and then it has to be combined with the reforms to the age uh, of retirement. It has to be combined with the reforms of the obligations uh, right. pe uh, government takes. It's, it's, it's a very large issue which requires... Right, fair enough. Uh, <coughs> Sana, with your permission, mm -hmm. let me ask a question, or put a question to Dr. Gulfaraz Saab as well. Yes. Uh, sir, you have uh, worked in the energy sector for quite some time. And one issue that, is, uh, that seems to be killing us is the circular debt. Earlier it was merely in the energy sector, but now we seem to have developed one in the gas sector as well. What is the solution? How to actually curb it? Okay. Uh, and, when, and I also mm -hmm. just like to add, when we talk about the, um, uh, the structural mm -hmm. reforms um, that Mr. Shahrukh was talking about, um, uh, perhaps not just in the energy sector, but in, in, in the overall uh, aspect of, uh, of different sectors and the economy and the political situation, this aspect of, of <coughs> bringing about reforms have also been something we've been hearing for quite some time now. Um, and it is something that, that requires real change, real policies, or real implementation of a lot of things. Can we really count on that? to actually happen um, and for, for the government or our leaders uh, to actually make that decision of bringing about those reforms. If that's so essential, are we taking the steps to doing it or do you see it happening? Mm. Yes, Dr. Gulfras. Um, <coughs> Mr. Patafi, the uh, real uh, issue with this circular debt is a misnomer. Mm -hmm. Circular debt is that when you have a number of entities yeah. Um, in, involved in a particular commodity and they owe each other mm -hmm. but once you pass through paper money through them <laughs> you go through it and everybody is paid and satisfied yeah. that is circular debt this is the whopping shortfall in the revenue compared with the expenditure so um, we have to be able to control our expenditure otherwise this will continue to go out of our um, control and out of uh, our reach. Um, but look at that, looking at that, um, the cost of provisioning energy mm -hmm. is much higher than the revenues that we get in return of uh, sale of energy. Mm -hmm. Whether it is, um, there are multiple factors and right. they've been with us for a very long time. First of all is the inefficiencies in the institutions. Mm -hmm. Second are the uh, technical losses because our system, both of power and the gas, 
they are very old system very inefficient system and gas losses mm. are in two digit figures whereas in australia which has a very large scale gas infrastructure like pakistan it is just 1% mm. losses mm. Uh, in double digit mm. uh, it is and this investment in controlling the gas losses is a very uh, profitable investment in fact you get the um, your cost back within 3 4 years by improving the fittings mm. similarly if you look at the uh, power side our grid at one time it used to be a national asset now of course it requires upgrade it, con- it requires continuous upgradation and improvement in efficiency and control of transmission and distribution losses mm-hmm. then on top of it we have other losses one are the thefts of mm-hmm. power and gas and unfortunately it's very difficult to recover because there is a mismatch mm-hmm. power sector the distribution companies come under the um, federal government institutions mm-hmm. but the recovery from the consumers is under the provincial g- control and because of that um, mismatch it is very difficult for the uh, federal institutions of power distribution to gain full support of the provincial government to recover the cost so mm-hmm. there are uh, those multiple things add up the, which cause the whopping hole in our uh, revenue receipts mm-hmm. and uh, that is what is causing but one more important source of um, this circular debt that you call it in the power sector that all the power plants which were negotiated under the china pakistan economic corridor yeah. unfortunately there was a flaw in them first of all we did not ourselves work on what kind of power plant at what location mm-hmm. is ideally suited and needed by us we left mm-hmm. it to the chinese planning and mm-hmm. chinese uh, uh, sort of um, Uh, proposals and then it was understandable that since chinese were going to make the investment so the chinese companies had to be involved mm-hmm. but the chinese government could have carried out a competitive bidding from among the chinese company mm-hmm. and you could have brought the cost down and you could have improved the technology and because those things were not done first of all the projects were not exactly as we needed them not at the locations not at the type right. and second there was no competitive bidding from among the chinese company the costs were high mm-hmm. and third of course the technology was not all the best as a result of it right. the our um, capacity prices right. the capacity price that you are required to pay to them right. is enormous and that is going to continue to mount so doctor sir when yes. imf uh, reportedly asked pakistan to actually renegotiate with these power companies part of cpac uh, to renegotiate the package 300 billion uh, rupees that uh, pakistan has to pay uh, that it should be renegotiated do you think that we should be doing it and then is there a scope for renegotiation as well um, i personally feel that you could not get away from renegotiation Okay. Sooner or later, mm. um, even the Chinese government would realize that your economic woes and predicament is um, increasing because of that uh, burden that's placed on our power sector. Um, since we slipped, since the Chinese government slipped uh, from enforcing the competitive bidding, now um, IMF has picked it up because it's a very serious issue. Mm. It's a burden on our, ec- on our economy, mm. and it will continue to increase. And, right. uh, and I may say that uh, somehow or the other, the nature does, does justice. Uh, the government is handed by the Prime Minister and it was during their government that yeah. they actually the CPA, let, CPA. These, CPA. Uh, let these <laughs> power projects yeah. flow through without critical examination and actually they must, uh, they right. should be obligated to renegotiate as soon as possible before the government changes. All right. And speaking of the IMF, I want to also come to whether or not, um, considering the kind of talks that we've already had with the IMF um, and the situation that Pakistan is in economically, Mr. Sharo, um, do you think that the current budget actually helps us move towards uh, talks with the IMF that will result in a positive outcome for the government of Pakistan and will be able to see something uh, that is beneficial for the country? And whether or not every aspect of this budget, do you think, will be in line with the IMF and or perhaps perhaps that there may be objections raised to some points. Thank you. Um, I would 
be surprised if the IMF did not know what the budget was going to be before we did. So I think this is uh, with their consent, and I probably and I, I from what I believe that they probably went line by line in the budget, and there were probably some negotiations between the finance ministry and the IMF on what keep what stays in and what doesn't. Uh, because primarily the the essence here is right now is to resume that program. And without resuming the program, Pakistan's macroeconomic stability is at risk. So, uh, so I, I think it would be fine. I think the, the sort of the, the budget tries to achieve a spot between appeasing the IMF and not offending the Pakistani people too much, and sort of trying to get that stabilization by just right without it being too politically costly. So I think it does that. Uh, it probably will do that fairly well. And I think uh, uh, that would, uh, we should hope that over the coming few weeks, the IMF program is officially resumed. Uh, in fact, it's not only a hope. I think that that, that has to happen. Otherwise, we will devalue further and there will be, there will be further uncertainty in the market. Uh, whether it's beneficial for Pakistan, it's it's basically it's exactly the same which we did three four years we did in 2018 19. It's stabilisation again, so it's not it's beneficial in the sense that we do have to do it. If we don't do it, it we move towards a default, and that's far worse. But beneficial in the sense that do you actually get growth and prosperity, and do people's incomes will rise? Will uh, will the will the, the coming few years people will have a better life than they had 20 years ago and 10 years ago or five years ago? Mm. That that doesn't come from the budget. That comes from overall reforms to the government uh, to, to how governments make public policy decisions. How do they and invest? So yeah. uh, uh, yes, as you, as the guest uh, uh, Dr. Saab was saying about the energy, right? So it's it's how do you actually make public investments? How do you decide which power plant goes in, which doesn't go in? So those are sort of bigger structural issues of the economy, and we have ignored them across political cycles, and that's why we are here yet again. That we have to go to the IMF and they have to approve our budget. That's not a. Right. That's not some. Uh, which is not me, a very good. Sharaf, let me ask you a very basic mm -hmm. question, and uh, I'm not going to talk about 75 years or the past 20 years, 30 years. Let me ask you about the last budget speech, uh, in which uh, it seemed that Pakistan is moving in the right direction, that the fundamentals are okay, and the, it was actually very ambitious, and there was a target of surplus. Then why is it that all of a sudden, the, within a matter of year, we have reached such a whopping de deficit? What went because wrong? Everything, well, uh, the, 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 we did exactly the same thing we do every uh, within every few years. As soon as we get a bit more breathing space, we effectively. So in this case, there was confounding variables, as we say, right? So there were things which were out of government's control, the pandemic and the global commodity boom and all of that stuff didn't help. So that made things worse. But fundamentally, the government didn't reform the country's economic structure. So when it had room to invest more, it did, and it generated more growth than it could sustain. The problem fundamentally is this Pakistan's economy, it's not hard to get economic growth in Pakistan because the population growth is over 2%. So it's it's very easy. You just invest a bit and you get over 5% GDP growth. The problem is whenever that happens, the imports start skyrocket. That's what the government did. They wanted to have growth. So they generated a lot of growth. And this is why there was nearly 6% GDP growth, as the economic survey showed, showed yesterday. But you can't... But what's the use of the growth when you can't sustain it? Because whenever that growth comes, that happened in 2018, that happened last year, that happened... 2012, 2013, whenever you get that growth boom, your external account, so your import bill, is un you're unable to cover because your imports skyrocket. And that's because the nature of our growth. Our growth is driven by consumption, uh, by uh, largely by consumption, which increases import bills, and we don't export export nearly enough to cover that. And for that, you need to we need to think about who's getting the subsidies in the economy. Why is real estate left unblanked and untaxed for such a long time? Why you can't we can't sell plots to other countries? So why why are uh, firms incentivized to produce low quality, high premium goods within the Pakistani yeah. market and not export? So all of this but, has but to be fixed. But hang on, hang on, Otherwise hang on. You, uh, you just said something very interesting that uh, we have to actually ask ourselves who is getting the, the subsidies, right? And this is an argument that was made when it came to petroleum prices that uh, government is subsidizing, uh, you know, petroleum products for the rich as well. But when we have started removing those subsidies, the first thing we see is cascading effect on everything else.
So it essentially means that somehow it is more complicated uh, rather than black and white, and it is going to somehow uh, remove subsidies or uh, uh, penalize the, the, the common man on the street as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if uh, uh, you are uh, targeting the rich, the poor also suffers. The poor are already suffering, but on the petroleum subsidies, it's slightly complex. So the, the co first of all, nothing is black and white. Everything is complicated. Yeah. That's one thing. The other thing is on petroleum subsidies, the, the nature of the subsidies, which is so humongous, they counterfactual. The, uh, the alternative would have been let the, let the country default because we wouldn't be able to pay for imports because we were incentivizing something which we don't own. We buy in dollars and we sell in rupees and we were subsidizing it in rupees. So th no, it but, made absolutely but Intellectuals no like but you will, will, help, uh, will have to help us uh, understand that why is it that only petroleum products or subsidies are important, but these white elephants we call SOEs that are there and we are not doing anything to divest or privatize them and we keep on subsidizing them and they are not a priority and some are petroleum product that is used by all and sundry is the biggest issue. So, so two things. First of all, petroleum subsidy is quite, quite, a, quite large. They were large more than the current expenditure of the government. So they were humongous in that, right? The second thing is, of course, these SOE subsidies aren't, aren't efficient either. They should be, I'm completely in agreement. They, you shouldn't be running uh, state-owned enterprises. You shouldn't be running them even if they make a profit because it makes absolutely mm. no sense for the government to do this stuff. You're distorting the market. Government has a lot of things to do. It has to run schools and public transport and hospitals. It has no right running a steel mill or, a, or an airline or all the dozens of other things it runs. So there's quite a bit there. So uh, it should absolutely privatize it. I don't think there will be a lot of buyers to buy a lot of this stuff. If, if you give me the steel mill, even for one rupee, I wouldn't buy it because it has so much debt on it. So right. the, 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 how would you find the right way to uh, disinvest in it? That, that, that that's what the gov government should actually consider because it's an important part of moving towards a truly competitive fair economy and not providing, not using these white elephants to provide basically jobs. But that's right, what they do. Absolutely. They provide I'll jobs to... Yeah. Right. Um, Dr. Gulfraz, uh, when we, yeah. we've already earlier also talked about um, uh, the, the Charter of Economy, and this is something that the Prime Minister had spoken about since he assumed office, and there was a lot of emphasis on developing this, because this is essentially what we need in order to bring about the kind of reforms we're talking about, because whatever it is uh, with regards to the, to the budget um, that, that needs uh, to be implemented to get relief to the masses is, in fact, in, in the structural and foundational changes we're, we're referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, but that will only come if there exists uh, some sort of a framework or structure that we'll be able to follow despite any uh, political changes as well. And, and that, of course, adds to our problems too. Um, so do you think that when we, when we talk about the different ways and strategies that exist in, in curbing this and in developing this mechanism, will we be able to see a charter of economy? And what sort of input will be going into that actually developing something um, and mm. ensuring that that, that that is used uh, for different political parties or for different governments to come um, and is not subject to the turmoil that we uh, face, uh, unfortunately, quite often. And Dr. Zahab, uh, with Sana's permission, I'm once again going to sneak in a question uh, for you regarding SOEs once again. Uh, when we are saying that we are taking tough decisions, are we still taking decisions which are tough enough? Hmm. Because there seems to be a lot of political mileage involved in not the offloading all the SOEs hmm. because then you, you employ so many people, right? Uh, is it not important to actually uh, convince the government to get rid of all departments or as many as possible, especially the bigger ones, big ticket items? Yes. Um, Yes, Dr. Kufras. Um, first of all, about the Charter of Economy, I, I fully agree with you that uh, uh, whenever the political changes take place, um, new governments formed, uh, election take place, we tend to start ab initio. And there is no continuity, there is no constancy of the uh, plans, programs, priorities mm. which have been working for some time. Mm. For example, right now, I would say to this government that whatever is working, whether it belonged to the last government or the previous government, continue that, reinforce it, mm. rather than reinvent the wheel. Mm. Persistence, in fact, as you were talking fact, about. In fact, we should build upon stents and not every time uh, start new foundation. So the, uh, that kind of charter, whether it comes about through a political dialogue 
and political, let's say, um, uh, confluence. Uh, but at least each government should first of all continue to uh, praise those programs which are in place, which are working, and only add impetus to those programs and not start new ones all over again. Right. Um, the point that um, Mr. Patafi, um, you raised the point uh, regarding um, tough decisions. The, the tough decisions. Yeah. Um, I fully agree with you that if once you determine that the public enterprises, mm -hmm. public hasn't been able to run them efficiently, public has not been able to compete with the private sector, mm -hmm. and therefore they continue to run in losses, and uh, we continue to cover those losses. It is very uh, onerous that out of mere budget support, we are maintaining those state enterprises. Every time a government thinks of mm -hmm. offloading these state enterprises, there are so many forces that work counter to that. So there's no, uh, when you talk about the um, charter of economy, there has to be one of the fundamental part of the charter of economy that all political forces within the country must realize that this is uh, the uh, national economy is bleeding constantly through these public enterprises and therefore they need to be offloaded. Okay. Till, the, till there is a confluence among all political forces. For example, if I just want to give you an example that if this government wants to offload any particular uh, political uh, pu public sector enterprise hmm. from within the government there are forces which would not let them yeah. happen that so therefore this is a point which needs to be debated and it must be um, across the political divide they must come to a confluence uh, otherwise you have been um, I have been part of the programs where uh, the Prime Minister said that all public sector enterprises must be privatized within six months mm -hmm. And when I started Six preparing, oh, when, wow. when I started preparing um, vigorously because the petrol, Ministry of Petroleum had the largest and the mm. most number of public enterprises, and I was very sure that within six months there's going to be accountability, not a single one got uh, privatized and there was no follow-up. Right. Oh, wow. But uh, you, since you have actually uh, worked in the public sector, let me ask you another thing. Mm. You just pointed out about this reset that whenever a new government actually mm. comes, they reset the policies and abandon many projects. Mm. I understand that. But then there is this element of muscle memory because of uh, our public sector, our bureaucracy as well. And that continues. Uh, for example, one great example is BISP, uh, mm. Benazir Income Support Program. It kept on mushrooming. And even now, uh, 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 during the previous governments and this government, it continues. So don't you think that there's already the, the, this muscle memory and not all projects are abandoned? No, no, I agree with you. This, those things which have taken roots among masses, yeah. where there is going to be a question of uh, popular support, losing a popular support, the governments are very sensitive to that, they continue. Mm -hmm. But then you see, every government should, if a program is in existence, then every government should come prepared how to make that program more efficient. Right. And that improvement in efficiency uh, should continue. And that is something missing. Sometimes they think that we should not really deal with the program given by the old government. And mm. they would rather discontinue. But there should be a progressive improvement, refinement as we go through progressive government. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Sharukh, another aspect that I want to talk about is with regards to whether or not this budget is going to be able to um, facilitate the uh, the growth of young entrepreneurs and startups in the country. And Pakistan has witnessed huge exponential growth of startups um, in the last year. Um, and we have seen uh, that uh, despite that, uh, the, the kind of emphasis that we'd like uh, on R&D um, and uh, from a private sector doesn't really exist. Um, in, in terms of what the government can do with regards to perhaps building an infrastructure or having a framework where we can support uh, the uh, entrepreneurship culture within our country, um, all the youth to come forward with their startups. Uh, do you think that that sort of um, is, is there in, in the policies or aspects that have been laid out um, in the budget and, and the way that any sort of facilitation is provided to the youth? There are loans, but uh, perhaps nothing more than that. 
And those loans also, sir, uh, regarding how the way they are actually sub uh, supplied, first of all, you have to actually make the bid, you have to apply for it. Then there's a list of these projects. Then they go for dips. Uh, they, they actually b go for balloting. And after that, whichever project survives gets the money. Why is it that there, there isn't any more uh, efficient way to identify good projects? Mm. I'm, I'm generally not in, in favor of government being involved in identifying good projects anyway. It's, what the government's job is to provide the right regulatory environment and to incentivize investment in areas where the, it thinks has significant retur social returns. Yeah. So it can provide sort of, the thing is what usually happens is whenever industry starts, starts booming in Pakistan, it gets close to the government. And it's, um, instead of becoming sort of proper industry which can compete globally, it becomes a mechanism of rent seeking. So it goes to the government and asks for a package or an immensity or something of that sort and sort of becomes that sort of a relationship. The best I think the government can do here, the government has made investments in technology sector. It has provide like providing 3G and 4G internet access. It should do with the same thing fifth generation. Try to look at how to get fiber optics and how to make internet faster. Uh, look at how to make transport and connectivity better. Provide those sort of enabling factors, and then let the market and the private sector determine which is the best project and which is the best of course, yeah. Because the yeah. second second you get the government involved in that, actually investing money in firms, that's where you get corruption, and that's where you get rent seeking, and that's where you get a lot of. And also, governments don't actually know who's what's best. So it's 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 not a very good uh, uh, strategy. So, and that sort of ties back to what your other guest was referring to was in how sort of this inertia uh, within policy making exists in Pakistan. And that goes to the broader point of how to improve decision making within the public sector. And that's something which has to be also focused on. And that requires looking at the civil service, that requires looking at how do you, how much autonomy they have, how much, what kind of incentive structures they have. Do you have the right way of recruiting and promoting people in the civil service? And how are decision, economic policy, but also broadly public policy decisions made in the government? And that requires sort of this overall right. change. And, and, and framework is important, but let me very quickly mm -hmm. ask you also, what is wrong with our private sector, particularly when it comes to financing uh, sector because uh, whenever there is uh, some kind of capacity building exercise by the federal government or any government uh, we see that most of the invest investment goes into car financing or deadbeat projects rather than actually going for VC or uh, venture capitalism Pakistan, the Pakistan financing sector, well, some of this is crowding out. The government crowds out private investment in Pakistan because the government borrows from private banks. And because government doesn't, it has the lowest risk of defaulting among any of us, uh, so it's much easier for the, for the banks just to sit and provide loans to the government rather than to the private businesses. So that's sort of that's what we call crowding out. So that crowds out private investments uh, from uh, for financing firms. So that's a bad infrastructure, bad infrastructure. And then same thing with car financing and others. That's what government incentivizes through either regulatory ease, through uh, subsidies, through tax uh, uh, and import restrictions. That's what you're incentivizing the people to spend on, banks to spend on. And that's a very right. big... Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sharo, for being with us um, and Dr. Gulfaraz for taking the time out and being thank a you. part of the debate and talking to us uh, with regards to the budget and the key aspects and challenges that exist. Um, we hope that this budget is just the start of, of a better economic situation for the country mm -hmm. and to be able to provide some relief to the masses. We are struggling through a difficult economic time um, and uh, this is a balanced budget that has been put forward and we really hope that it can benefit the people in the long run that we are able to make the structural and fundamental reforms that we really need to. Thank you so much for watching the debate. That's all we have for now.